you have the power to create the life that you want and you're responsible to create this life. You're responsible for the way you choose to show up in the world. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Who am I and why am I here? If you've ever pondered these questions, today's episode is for you. We cover existentialism, taking responsibility for our lives, and living with authenticity. Our special guest today is Dr. Sarah Kubrick. Dr. Sarah Kubrick is an existential psychotherapist, consultant, former columnist for USA Today, and author of It's On Me. She is passionate about helping people seek change and live authentic, free, and meaningful lives. Her interest in psychology stems from her personal experience experience, living through wars, navigating complex relationships, and continually learning what it means to be human. Hello, Sarah. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm doing well. I'm a little tired, a little overstimulated, (laughs) but I'm, I'm excited summer and I'm excited to be talking to you. Yeah, I'm excited too. I know we mentioned we were both kind of tired. I'm jet lagged and you're like dealing with a heat wave. (laughs) Yes. Okay. So let's start off by like describing exactly what you do. Like what is an existential psychotherapist? That's a great question. Uh, Many people will be like, I get existentialism. It's like a bunch of old dead men that talk about unhappy things. And then I get therapy, which helps people. And I just don't get how they connect. (laughs) And truly, it's just about the fact that each therapist has a theory or a way of understanding their client and their client's problems. So if you practice from an attachment theory while you're talking to your client, you're detecting attachment, family systems, you're looking at different dynamics within the family. And as an existential psychotherapist, I look for themes like responsibility and authenticity and meaning and isolation. And so I kind of use this philosophy to inform the way I understand suffering and change um, and the goals that my clients want to achieve. Okay. So tell us more about your story, I guess, and how you became a psychotherapist and why you pursued this career. Yeah. So I lived through two wars by the age of nine and then immigrated to Canada. And so I've had these, which, you know, immigration itself can be quite startling. Where were you from originally? Serbia, I should explain that. I was, yeah, so I was born in Bosnia. The conflict kind of erupted there. We moved to Serbia, then there was the NATO bombing, and then we immigrated to Canada. And all of those experiences come with certain challenges. And obviously, your, you know, your family is going through a lot, your community is going through a lot, even though you're little and might not fully understand it. And so, I think from a really young age, like this fundamental trust in the world and people was kind of taken away from me. And I I became really curious, like what makes people tick and why do people do the things they do? Because my child brain could not comprehend why we were, why there was so much fear and chaos growing up. Um, And so I sort of, you know, started pursuing psychology as a way to gain understanding of my own experiences, if I'm being perfectly honest. And then eventually um, that kind of morphed into really wanting to, you know, help people who were suffering and be part of their journey. And I have always had like an existential lean without even understanding, like I would read Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and Hesse and all these people. And then in grad school kind of stumbled upon existential analysis, fell in love. Um, it really resonated with my own meltdown in my twenties and then it kind of morphed from there. Amazing. I mean that I I it's so heavy to hear you speak about that. I've actually been to like Bosnia and, and that what? area because I was visiting Croatia. I know it's very random. Like we wow. took a day trip out there. <laughs> and so that I saw firsthand like how you can feel like the aftermath of the war still. Like it's it's still. very recent and it it's so crazy to me. But I mean, yeah, what a great story. So tell me, I guess in a nutshell. Like, what is the main message that you try to share through this existential psychology? Like, I I guess, help us understand what it is and the main lessons. 
What is the point, I guess? I think it's about <laughs> not shying away from really hard questions and from hard realities and truths in life. It's encouraging people to feel empowered and autonomous and free to really get in there and try to figure it out. It's less about teaching people how to live the quote unquote right way and more about saying you have the power to create the life that you want and you're responsible to create this life. You're responsible for the way you choose to show up in the world. Of course, we all have restrictions and constraints and we all have things that are imposed on us. But then what? What are you going to do then? And I think it's kind of, I find it a very empowering sort of modality because it's really focused on the power that remains within you, the freedom that you have. And I think responsibility, you know, changed and saved my life in a way. And so I'm hoping that it will do the same for my clients of like, yeah, why are you here? And who are you? Like These really big existential questions. I think sometimes we avoid them and we often deal with the manifestations of not knowing those answers. So being in crappy relationships and not knowing how to set boundaries and having negative self-talk. And um, most of the time we try to target those behaviors. And what I like about existentialism, it kind of goes, okay, yes, of course we should, we should, you know, pay attention to these behaviors, but where are they really coming from? And are there deeper questions um, that are kind of manifesting this way? It's so interesting to hear you talk about it because I feel like I've been you know, asking these same questions in my life and I've been learning these things, but I've never, you, I, I didn't know it belonged to this field of existential psychology, right? Like the, why am I here? The taking responsibility for your life. I would love to take credit for it, for existentialism, but obviously this is a very universal human condition. So I think everyone talks thinks about this, but I think what's unique about existentialism is that it does target common human experiences and it really focuses on those. And so um, I don't think you have to be an existentialist to ask these questions, but I think we all ask them and that's good to know. It's good to put it out there that we're all grappling with these topics. All right, let's take a break for today's sponsor, 23andMe. As someone who's passionate about wellness and longevity, I'm always looking for ways to support my health journey. That's why I'm so excited about 23andMe plus Total Health. 23andMe plus Total Health is a platform revolutionizing the way we think about longevity and proactive health. It isn't just about genetic testing, it's about creating a health plan that's personalized and unique to you. They provide advanced genetic screening, giving you valuable insights, potentially leading to early disease detection and prevention, as well as comprehensive blood testing that goes beyond routine labs to evaluate how your health is changing throughout the year. I'm most excited to find out my biological age, which tells you how old you really are internally based on biomarkers. This is a number you can slow down or even reverse with the right lifestyle choices. If you want to take your health to the next level, try 23andMe plus Total Health. Advocate for your health today. Go to 23andMe.com slash TLL to receive 10% off. That's 10% off at 23andMe.com slash TLL. Disclaimer, Total Health membership includes services initiated and performed by third-party clinicians and lab providers through the 23andMe platform. Additional terms and conditions apply. See 23andMe to learn more. Total Health membership is not available to residents of Hawaii, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, and U.S. territories. Okay, so let's talk about responsibility, which is one of the concepts you talked about. So tell us how learning about what responsibility, what that means has helped you make a positive change in your life? So for me, responsibility is an interesting concept because you can't be responsible if you're not free. So it means like if you had no no freedom of choice in a particular context, like you couldn't choose to do that or not do that, then you're not re- really responsible for that option. But if you had the freedom to choose and you chose wrong or you made a mistake, then you are responsible for it. And I like it because I started to see this connection between freedom and responsibility, which changed my attitude towards responsibility. I used to be like, it's blame. (laughs) It's shaming me. It's blaming me. It's making me like do all these uncomfortable things. I don't want it. I don't think anyone else wants it. But then I started to realize like, wow, when I feel the weight of responsibility, I need to really understand how much freedom I have and how empowering and liberating that is. And when you take responsibility for your life, it 
it means that you're way more intentional about the way you live it because you don't want to make that mistake and then have to own up to it. You don't want to have those apologies. You don't want to have to. And you start to take your decisions more seriously. And you realize that like you have so much power in creating who you become. And that's really cool, but also really scary. And so for me, it was for the first time being like, wow, cool. I'm this thing that I can mold and I need to be really careful and intentional because I need to take responsibility for the way I do it. Now, it doesn't mean I won't make mistakes because of course everyone makes mistakes, but it made me take life very seriously, made me take decision-making very seriously from like the smallest things of like, I have a really big day. Will I have a matcha? Will I have tea or will I have coffee? Now, this seems like pretty silly, but it's not because I know that my nervous system reacts very differently to all three. So if I want to be anxious the whole day, nervous about what people think about me, if I want to have my entire conversations sort of a colored through anxiety, then yeah, I should have a cup of coffee before I start my day. But if I don't want that, then I should probably have tea or matcha. And so for me, I started to notice how every decision I needed to take responsibility for and how much it impacted my life and the outcome of like every day. Yeah. That's amazing. I I think we also need to, I guess, highlight what it looks like to not take responsibility. Because I think <laughs> responsibility is like an odd concept to some people who, you know, I don't think people realize that they're not taking responsibility in their lives in certain areas, right? Like there's a lot of areas in life where we think we're the victim or we blame other circumstances or whatever. So give us an example of what that looks like. For sure. So in my book, I talk about this character called Chad. He's a made up made up dude. And Chad is like 32. Let's let's say he's 32 and he is mistreating every single partner he has. He's avoidant, he never commits, he cheats on them or he hurts them in some way and this is his pattern. And now you find out that Chad when he was in high school had a really traumatic event. So his parents got divorced and it was really messy and that was really really difficult for him or for example his first girlfriend in college cheated on him. And then you go, okay, Chad, these experiences explain why you might have the tendency to protect yourself and be avoidant and lash out and do the self-sabotage, but they do not justify. At what point does Chad need to become responsible for the way that he treats other people? And that is really the responsibility piece of like, you are hurting yourself, you're hurting those around you, and you are not really doing anything about it. And you're maybe blaming things in the past that of course impacted you. But at some point at 32, you have to understand that there's been a decade in which you could have taken responsibility for your healing, seeing a therapist, (laughs) talking to your parents about it, your ex-girlfriend about it, and just really processing it and changing your behavior. And often I'll have people say, well, Of course, Chad should change so that he treats his girlfriends better. And I always go, actually, no, that's not why Chad should change, although that's a nice outcome. Um, The girlfriends that choose to date Chad while he's behaving that way, that's their responsibility. (laughs) The reason that Chad should change is because he deserves to have a fulfilling life. And until Chad takes responsibility... He's not going to. He's not going to have the relationships he truly yearns for. He's not going to have the healing that he wants and deserves as a human being. And so I think that that's an interesting thing of like, to live your best life, you kind of need that responsibility. Yeah. Oh my God. Thanks for sharing that example. Because it's so, it just makes this concept so much easier to understand. And then it also, I love the distinction of, yes, someone's pain and trauma explains why they are a certain way, but it doesn't justify it. I think that's like highlight that. (laughs) Because a lot of people, especially if you're like a forgiving person, you might like forgive people too easily who make these mistakes because you're like, oh, I understand why he did that or why he's that way or why he has these issues. What is your take on being, I I guess, that side as well? It is that other person's responsibility, whether or not they accept that behavior, right? Yeah, I do think so. Look, I'm not saying that someone screws up and you cut them off. I think that's pretty extreme. In that case, we would all be alone forever because we all screw up (laughs) to an extent. But I think for me, there's a difference between um, choosing to be in an intimate relationship with someone who is clearly 
unable or unwilling to have that sort of intimacy or connection or someone that keeps hurting me. I also think that there's, you know, um, a difference between forgiving a behavior that came up once versus a pattern. And ultimately you can want the best for someone. You, you can love someone and still choose not to be with them because your responsibility is for you. And um, that sounds a little harsh sometimes, especially when someone is really trying. But for me, I think, you know, it's hard, even as a therapist, I'm super empathetic. (laughs) And then you have to be like, okay, well, is this person really trying to change? Because apologies come with changed behavior. And unless there is a change behavior that comes with the words, it's really kind of um, disrespectful to yourself to keep staying in patterns that hurt you. So I would say that staying with someone who's constantly hurting you, obviously this gets very convoluted with abuse and, and, and trauma bonding and all this stuff. But let's just say that you don't have an abusive relationship and it's not trauma bonding. It's just like a guy from Tinder that's mistreating you. Um, I think it's, it's important to realize that that's, we get mad at him, but really a lot of that is also on us. The fact that we're saying like, I think it's equal distribution of responsibility. Yeah. Another aspect of responsibility that I want to touch on is this concept of like what you are, what you can be responsible for, and then what you cannot. Like, for example, like you can't be responsible for other people's feelings. It, it, oh, it, it's such extremes. There's people that are like, I can say and do anything, and I'm not responsible for your feelings. You should be responsible for your feelings. And it's like, mm-hmm. okay, I get you, buddy, but like you evoked those feelings. So fine, you're not responsible for them having them if you if you want to do that mental gymnastics but you are responsible for the actions that evoked those feelings <laughs> so i don't like the full like i'm not responsible at all the fact i yell at, yelled at you and now you're right. crying like your feelings are yours and it's like no no <laughs> no no <laughs> so I, I think that gets <laughs> taken to like an extreme and then there's also individuals who really struggle and they take everyone's responsibility on themselves which ironically is irresponsible <laughs> Oh, and explain why. Because I think a lot of my audience and myself lean towards that that part, right? The one where you're the people pleaser, trying to make everyone happy. <laughs> yeah, so do I. So I, I totally get it. I think we think we're being so extra responsible when we take everything on. And in reality, we are not being responsible to the person we are, to the self-care that we deserve, to the boundaries that we deserve. We're actually not taking care of ourselves when we do that which means you're not taking full responsibility for yourself. And you're also not really helping the person who's not taking responsibility. It's kind of enabling them to go through life without realizing the consequences of their actions or whatever it is. And so it comes from like a super genuine, sweet, empathetic space. It also comes a bit usually from fear of like wanting to belong and wanting to to be loved and wanting to be low maintenance and wanting to do all these things, which, which come, you know, and I, and I think you shouldn't fault your motivation. I just think there's a healthier way to do that. And so my suggestion is like, if you're doing everything and everything's your responsibility, it really boils down to you not being responsible for you because you're taking way too much on and it's so unfair. Yeah. Ultimately remember the priority should be like you and your well being, right? Absolutely. And then the rest follows. <laughs> okay. So tell us more about your book. It's on me. Um, what is the main message of this book? Well, if you couldn't guess from the title and this conversation, right. responsibility. No. So the book is about a concept of self-loss. And I had this moment in my twenties where I was with a friend in like a whiskey bar in LA and I haven't seen him for, I don't know, a couple, maybe a year or two. I started grad school and, and I was doing all these things and we were sitting there and he was like, Oh, Sarah, it's like really impressive. Um, are you happy? And I don't think anyone's really asked me that. Like I was very in my twenties and my teens, I was very much like, how do I check off all the boxes, make sure I'm doing all the shoulds, make sure my parents are proud, make sure the community, like, it's very much like, how do I fit the mold that I'm meant to fit? And as I was telling him about all my quote unquote success or all the things I was doing that most people like patted me on the back for, he was like, are you happy? And that 
broke me. Like I, it was one of the first times I've cried in public. It was super embarrassing for me at that time. And I remember stumbling to like the bathroom. And I don't know if you've had this experience of like looking in a mirror and just being like, you look, I I don't recognize you or you look so hollow to me. Like I feel so disconnected from the person I'm looking at in the mirror. And I had this moment of like, I don't know you. And worse than that, I think I hate you. And it was this beginning of me unraveling essentially for a couple of years and, and experiencing this thing called self loss. And that's what the book is about. It's really like, Hey, you don't know who you are. And it's a really scary, disorienting, lonely place to be. And I got you. And then the book kind of helps you figure out how to create that sense of self and meaning in your life. Um, so that's what the messaging is about. Yeah. So self loss is is basically your way of saying like when you feel like you've disconnected from yourself. Yeah. Got it. I, I wonder is this a millennial thing? Because everything you talk <laughs> about, I'm like, I've been through that. I get that. I grew up that way, and then I went through the existential crisis, and here I am. <laughs> yeah, it's very relatable, and I think there's a lot of like millennial women that we'll talk about in particular of like be the good girl don't say anything and just do it. Like there is a lot of conditioning that I feel like we all shared, but I do think it's a fairly universal thing. Like a lot of the quotes that I use are, you know, from Kierkegaard and Heidegger and Sartre and like, they were not millennial girls. And so it makes me feel like (laughs) this is a very universal thing, but it's being uniquely expressed and maybe more intensified now and particularly, particularly in millennials. And I would say Gen Z. So how do you answer the questions like, who am I and why am I here? So that's a tricky one. Whenever I get people to do this exercise, they'll, you know, start listing their hobbies, their relationship status, their job titles. And those are, I would say, the roles that you play, the roles that you have. It doesn't mean they're not genuine. Sometimes they align, sometimes they don't, but these are your roles. And I think what's important to understand is, it's a little philosophical, but bear with me. There is no self without self-expression. You can't go into a cave and come out and be like, I know who I am. Because you haven't expressed that. You haven't lived that way. So you you can think Mm -hmm. you know who you are. So you can think you're the most patient person. Then you're in LA sitting in traffic and you start swearing, flipping people (laughs) off and honking. And then you go, oh my God, like that's strange. And in that moment you go, well, Either I don't understand who I am or or I'm not representing who I am. But the point is that you really need to see yourself out in the world to be able to understand who you are. It cannot just be this thought. It has to be expressed. So the answer to who am I is never a verbal one. The answer to who am I is the way you live your life. And that's the really kind of cool ongoing definition because I don't believe the self is static. I think it's always evolving. I think we're always creating it. And so um, you can look in a mirror and go, this is who I am right now, today, not forever because you're constantly changing, but the answer is really in the way you show up in the world. All right, let's take another break for today's sponsor, Jenny Kane. Fall is officially here, which means it's sweater weather. I've been loving my Jenny Kane cashmere cocoon cardigan. It's oversized, feels super soft and luxurious, and it's just the perfect piece to throw on whenever I'm lounging at home or stepping out. I have it in the oats color and it literally goes with everything. Jenny Kane excels at creating elevated wardrobe staples that are not only timeless, but also great investment pieces. Their collection is inspired by classic California minimalism and includes beautiful sweaters like the cashmere half sip and Flynn cashmere sweater. They also have a stunning home essentials collection with beautiful pieces to elevate your living space. Find your new uniform at jennykane.com. Get 15% off your first order when you use the code TLL at checkout. That's 15% off your first order at J-E-N-N-I-K-A-Y-N-E.com, promo code TLL. Let getting dressed be one less thing to worry about this season. Embrace your fall aesthetic with Jenny Kane. And that's exciting because it, yes, you can see who you are now, but because it's it's how we show up in the world, then it also means like, I am who I decide to be, right? Because you can change your habits, you can change 
your identity, change your fashion. Like, <laughs> right? Yeah, there's, I love that. We're so flexible. We can like because I believe we're we're always changing and evolving as well. And I like to do that with intention. But yeah, hearing your definition is is even more exciting because <laughs> like you can't really define yourself. You can't really define yourself. It's yeah, it's really cool. It's like those moments of constant redefining. And I love that you use the fashion metaphor because I usually say people hope that it's like find yourself rather than create yourself. That's why I don't like the term find yourself. It's almost like yeah. you're going in a closet, trying on a bunch of sweaters. You put it on and you're like, this is it. I'm gonna die in this sweater. Like <laughs> and you know, and, and that that that's your sweater. And I feel like that's what we try to do with our personality or identity or our sense of self. And, and a lot of that is like, no, you're going to try something on. It's going to fit in that moment. And the next moment, it's not going to be the right fit. And that's okay. And so yeah. I think it just talks yeah. to like the perpetual becoming, which to me is so exciting to the people who look in a mirror like I was 10 years ago and won't go, I hate this person. Not so exciting because they want to believe there is a version of them out there that they like more. And I yeah. kind of go, you know, you can look at yourself and not like yourself and then you have the power to change it. But that perfect version doesn't it really exist without your participation. And that's a hard truth. Yep. And then there's also the scenario I'm thinking of people who maybe had like their golden years and they're trying to hold on to that version of them, even though like maybe things have changed. And then they they try to go back to the past and live in the past. I mean, there, there's so many ways to look at this. <laughs> how do you advise people on how to love who they are as they are now and as they are ever changing? This is an interesting thing. Everyone talks about self-love so much. And I think it's great. And I think if you get to the place where you love yourself, that's fantastic. But I think there's two steps before that, actually three. <laughs> I think first you need to accept yourself where you're at, just acknowledge, accept it then I think you need to respect yourself. Then I think you can like yourself. And then I think you can love yourself. I don't think we can like someone that we don't respect. And so that's like a really interesting combination of like, I, I don't necessarily try to get my clients to love every version of themselves. And sometimes maybe they shouldn't <laughs> like they should be super right. empathetic and caring, but it's not like they should be like, wow, I'm so proud of myself right now. Regardless. It's like, it's okay not to be proud. It's okay to feel a little bit of guilt yeah. or some, some emotions because they signal to you that you're not aligned with your morals, your values, you're not being your authentic self. And so for me, it's like, can you accept the version that you're being? Can you truly see it and accept it as you in this moment? And then how can we work towards pivoting your behavior? So it's someone you respect. And once you get that self-respect, oh boy, so much changes. The way that you relate to other people, the way that you relate to yourself, and then it's so much easier to get to the like and the love. But I think a lot of the times we we avoid the acceptance and the respect, and then we're kind of shut out of luck, if I'm allowed to say that on here. <laughs> yeah. No, I love that. It's very practical. It's true. You can't jump to self-love. And I think a lot of people struggle with that concept of self-love because it feels so far away. But you're right. It's like acceptance, respect, then then maybe like, and then maybe love. Exactly. And I'm always like, you know, if you can accept and respect, that's a fairly healthy relationship to me. Like, I'm like, congratulations, you know, but we have so much yeah. pressure on this, like, <laughs> on this like love concept that I think is setting unrealistic expectations. People are feeling frustrated. People don't even know what that means. Like what does it mean to love yeah. yourself? So I, I like to break it down because I think it's helpful. Yeah. Is your advice the same for those people who like for how to continue, I guess, loving or accepting yourself as you grow and change? When you become more intentional about your actions, and I love that you said like you try to live intentionally, it's so much easier to then accept what has happened, like you kind of get into the driver's seat and you start to change your relationship with accountability and you go, you know, I screwed up, but it's my mistake. And there's something about like, but it's mine and I own myself. And so actually the definition of authenticity, is something I talk about, I think it's been grossly misused <laughs> and watered down. So what's your definition? The definition of uh, authenticity comes from Heidegger. Uh, he's a German philosopher, and the I'm not going to try to pronounce the German 
word for it, but there was a word for it. And the actual definition was ownness, to own oneself, to own. And so his definition of authenticity sounds hell of a lot like responsibility. It wasn't like, it just feels right. It's like the authentic decision is the decision you're willing to take responsibility for. And I would say it's also the decision that aligns with your morals and values and who you want to become one day. Mm -hmm. And so when you're perpetually um, becoming, I think that acceptance becomes easier because if you're becoming and you're authentic, you're owning all of it. And then it's easier to accept that that's where you are, to see yourself exactly as you are and to go, oh, that's my participation. That's what I created. Okay, let's try something different. And so I think it it becomes easier the more you understand what being authentic actually means. Yeah, no, you definitely answered my it answered my question because, and from a different angle, actually, because it makes sense. Like, if you are continuing to be authentic and responsible for your life, then you're going to continue to like accept and like and love the person you become. I think what happens when people don't like who they become is when they're not being authentic, not taking responsibility. So, so the answer is is those two things, right? Responsibility and and being authentic to yourself. Absolutely. Well summarized, <laughs> considering yeah. I was like, Woo. yeah, <laughs> I mean, these are all concepts, but I want to know in your life, what was your journey to figure out and feel really good about like, who am I? Why am I here? Like, <laughs> how long did that take? And what was that journey like? Jeez, um, I would say that took, I mean, it's, it's still happening. Obviously, it's an ongoing process, but I would say it took probably about yeah, always becoming. Always becoming. It took about five, six years before I started to feel kind of the embodiment, the at home sensation, the intuition, the recognition of self in the mirror, the the sort of I have my own back. That took about five, six years. It is not a short process. Yeah. And I think I took it very seriously. Um I and I'm not suggesting everyone does this, but I did so many things that were inauthentic. They were objectively good, meaning no one would look at my life and go like, what is she doing? I hope she turns her life around. People are like, wow, congratulations. Mm -hmm. And that's what made it harder because I was like trapped Mm -hmm. in my own life. And I was so profoundly unhappy. And so what I had to do was just declutter and kind of blow it all up. <laughs> That's literally what I did to my, and I'm not suggesting everyone has to, but just my proportion of what was authentic versus inauthentic, it was like 90 10 psychology state. That's about it. And so it took a really long time because I first had to strip down everything I'm not to have space to create what I am. So think about cooking in a kitchen. If the kitchen is disgusting, and every pot and pan and and knife is used and scattered, you first have to clean it up before you can cook. Mm Because creativity takes space. And what you're doing is creating your sense of self. So you need space to do that from people, from expectations, from sometimes physical, I don't know, spaces, whatever it is. And so for me, it just took a really long time to figure out like what people should and shouldn't be in my life, what boundaries I wanted to set, what kind of relationships I wanted to have, who I wanted to, you know, express myself as. And the one fun sort of um, analogy or metaphor or kind of example I have for this is have you watched Runaway Bride? I actually don't think I have. (laughs) With Julia Roberts. Okay. It's okay. I'll tell you all about it. So Julia Roberts is known, her, her character Maggie is known for running away at the altar. So I think it was like six men that she's left at the altar and Richard Gere, who is a journalist or plays a journalist, hears about this. So he goes to her small town and interviews her and all her fiancés, previous fiancés, and her current fiancé. And the one question that he would ask them, which sounded really silly at the time, was, what kind of eggs does Maggie like in the morning? And they would all answer. And what was interesting about the answer is that they would all say a different answer. It was like boiled, scrambled, sunny side up. And then he would go, okay, but like, what... What eggs do you like? And guess what? It would perfectly match with the eggs she liked with each man. Uh. (laughs) 
I mean, who hasn't done this? And then <laughs> there's a scene where he kind of confronts Maggie and goes, oh my God, you're so lost. You don't even know what kind of eggs you like. And she goes, I'm not lost. It's just called changing my mind. And he goes, it's not changing your mind. It's not having a mind of your own. Mm. And I remember just being like, damn. And what I loved about it is that a couple scenes later, you see her in her kitchen. I don't know. She made like a dozen eggs and was trying them just in her silence in her kitchen by herself, tasting them deliberately for the very first time. She's eaten eggs her entire life, but she sat there to be like, okay, what do I want? What aligns? What feels good? What, what, what are my eggs? And that scene, the last like couple seconds was so profound to me. And that is the approach I took to figuring myself out. You're not going to be able to just know, no matter how much you meditate, no matter how much you journal, no matter how much therapy you do, you're going to have to get out there and try things yep. and then go, this yep. is not the right egg. This is not the right sweater. <laughs> Right now, maybe one day it will be, but it's like, it's, it is a lot of experimentation, a lot of trial and error, a lot of taking accountability for the mistakes you will make in this process and just kind of going, I'm just going to figure it out in the world because the self is expressed in the world. Yeah, I totally relate to that. Thanks for sharing that story. Cause I, I also had a point in my life where I had to erase, or I guess, like you said, declutter all that. I was not. And then just, I didn't know who I was or what I wanted to do, who I wanted to be. So I had to literally try all these different paths because you don't know until you try and take some action and then you get some feedback because then you, you realize, Oh, I thought I would like this, but actually there's some aspects I don't like. So let me try something else. And it's, it's not something you can sit there and think about. (laughs) Yeah. A hundred percent. Thank you for sharing that. I think we need to normalize it. Oh, definitely. In your journey, when you were going through that phase, did you have an ideal of who you wanted to be or were you literally just like step by step? That's such a good question. I don't think anyone's asked me that. (laughs) I think there were aspects of me that I knew, which were very career oriented. Although even now I have a career I didn't necessarily even think I would have because my, I was like, I'm going to be a psychologist or whatever. And now, you know, I'm doing so much social media and advocacy and and just so much more than I could have even imagined. But I think my issue was that I always was very academic. I was very career driven and that's all I knew. And so in my head, that was kind of when I thought, well, what do I want to be in the future? That was like a a, um, consistent little, little quiet voice that was like, well, you know, this aspect of your life, which really helped tie things in for me. But besides that, I had zero idea what kind of person I wanted to be. And when I say zero, I mean like literally zero. Um, And (laughs) it was really confusing. I remember, um, this is an embarrassing story, but I'm going to share it anyways. I don't know. I was like right pre-grad school. I don't know. I was seeing a boy and we went on like two dates. It was nothing (laughs) aggressive. It was just like... And he's like, you know, I think you're so great. He's like, so I don't want to ghost you, but I'm going to tell you something. And I was like, oh, good. Okay. That, <laughs> give me give me the feedback. <laughs> it's the only time it's ever happened. And he was just like, I think you're really boring. And I was like, that is a really, really mean thing to say That's to so me. That's so rude. <laughs> but I was like, okay. And he's like, no, 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 but bear with me. He's like, mm-hmm. It's not because you're not intelligent. It's not because you're not funny. It's because you do not know how to talk about anything outside of psychology or academia. Now, Uh, to be fair, I was like applying to grad school. So it's like chill. Like what? Like that was my world. But I think it was a really, he actually did me a service where it was like a really good wake up call that happened before this meltdown. And then after the meltdown and kind of reflected on it, of like, I just knew this because it was kind of like a pass fail. Plus there was passion and, you know, childhood stuff there. And I was like, yeah, but besides being a professional, I was, he really pointed out the fact that I had no idea. And so it was like, is Sarah gentle? Is Sarah direct? Is Sarah, does she like to travel? Does she not? Does she want a traditional family? Does she not? Does she want monogamy? Does she not? Like, all of it. And, you know, you kind of just get to figure it out as you go along. But no, if I'm to answer your question, no. (laughs) I wanted to be a nice person that has values and morals. That's, you know, 
No, yeah, thanks for sharing your story. I think there's no right or wrong way, but people are always curious of like what is the journey to like becoming your authentic self. Some people have a like an ideal, like this is my vision of who I want to be. Some and then others you just take it step by step. And and some is you know, some of us are a blend of both. But it's it's just nice to hear the different I guess, different paths. <laughs> totally. I think it was a weird blend where in one aspect, I had a very clear idea and in another, I had absolutely no idea. But as you said, there is no wrong way. Like we're all figuring it out. Okay. So going on to another topic, um, what is your take on how, how do we overcome suffering? Like suffering in the mind, suffering in the heart? Because a lot of people are suffering. So much, yeah. What is your take on that? <laughs> very existential. No, um, yeah. <laughs> I think suffering has gotten a bad reputation. And what I mean by that is, of course, I don't want anyone to suffer. But I think we also need to normalize the fact that we are suffering. And a lot of, you know, humanity suffers for prolonged periods of time. And so what helped me, I remember going to my therapist, and she said something to me that I didn't understand at the time until later I did. And she said, you're going to really struggle with life until you can find beauty in suffering. And I remember being like, screw you. <laughs> like, <laughs> really? What great advice. Thanks so much. And he felt really dismissive. I know he wasn't because mm. she was like the best therapist in the world. Um, but it was kind of like, it really rubbed me the wrong way where I'm like, I don't even know what you're saying. And of course, I don't want people to suffer. And of course, I think you need to look at your life and go, am I contributing to the suffering? Because that's all mm. you can change. If it's something outside yeah. of your control, you can endure. And humans have a beautiful capacity to do that and get a support system and just endure it until the storm passes. And that is like the best we can do. And then when we realize that we're the ones inflicting the suffering, and I think there's a lot of situations, myself included, where it was like I was actually inflicting it and yet a victim to myself, that's when you have to go okay, well, then your approach to suffering isn't just purely compassion, it's compassion and action. It means, yeah, be kind and gentle with yourself and also realize that you need to change your actions in order to stop suffering so much. Um, and I think those two things are really important to keep in mind. And then circling back to the beauty part is understanding that like all of it, all the emotions have something beautiful in them. And I think the first time that I like cried and was like, this is beautiful. I like heard my therapist's voice and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's not going to happen every time, but it was kind of like, wow, look at me expressing myself and look at, look at how much, how deeply I can truly feel. Cause my tears are really telling me how deeply I feel. And there was something really cool about that moment. I'm not advocating that we should be like, yay, the world is, you know, going in flames and we should find it beautiful. But there are moments where we truly can. Yeah. Yeah. It's not an, a simple like answer. It's not a simple question because you're right. There's so many different cases, right? For suffering that is like from something we can't control, like all you can do is endure. But like, I think when I ask about suffering, I'm talking more about suffering that people impose on themselves. And I kind of want you to go a little bit deeper into that. Like, how can we, you, you talked about like taking action, like compassion and action. So what do you mean by, by action? By action, I mean, is change your behavior. So there are sometimes extreme cases that I see where individuals be so deeply unhappy. And I'm going to use like a random example um, made up. Just let's say that you're married to someone you don't want to be married to or in a relationship that you don't want to be in a relationship with. And they go, well, I can't move to a different city. I can't, you know start a different job or I can't date other people and express myself and we, you know, blah, 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 because I'm in this relationship. And then they feel like their whole entire life is now trapped because of this relationship. And there's no way out because you're not willing to let go of this relationship. And so this would be partly self-inflicted because <laughs> what you have to understand and what I often tell people is like, you actually have a choice. You're not choosing to make a different choice, but you do have a choice. They're like, no, sir, I don't have a choice because if I leave, I'm not going to have financial support. If I leave, my family will be upset if I leave. And it's like, absolutely all those terrible things will happen. I'm not saying it's an easy choice. I'm not even saying you should take the choice, but you need to recognize 
the choice. And sometimes I think we are not willing to lose out on things like, well, my friend circle will fall apart. So I'm just going to stay in it. And the reason for that is that we forget that the cost is still there. Yes, the friend group is safe and that doesn't become the cost. But you know what becomes the cost? Your authenticity, your sense of self, your sense of expression, your fulfillment, your meaning, your respect. And so we often sort of pretend we don't have a choice. And then (laughs) we don't act because we go, well, I can't. And the reality is most of us have more choices than we think we do. Because if we were honest, we would go, I just don't want that to be my choice because I don't want to deal with the consequences. And by the way, again, I'm not talking about financially abusive relationships or any of those extreme contexts where, of course, your choices are much more limited and it is really unsafe and all all of that stuff. But I'm talking about the fact that like, when it's uncomfortable, we're like, well, that's not an option. It's like, no, that is an option. You could just you know, do those things and you won't like it. But ultimately, if you act and you have that sense of compassion, you can create a very different life for yourself. Yeah. I'll highlight the what you said about there's always a choice, even if it's not like an ideal choice, there will be consequences, but just know that you always do have a choice instead of acting like, oh, I have no choice. I'm stuck in the situation. I, right. It's like you could go back to school at 50. It would suck, but you can. I know you could leave your partner in five years. You'd be really sad, but you can. Like, it's good to remember that, like, you actually can do a lot of, a lot of things. Um, and either that's going to motivate you to try something different, or at least it will make you not feel like a victim to your life, but like you chose it. And sometimes nothing has to change except your mindset. And all of a sudden you have a healthier relationship with your current reality. Mm, yeah, yeah. Cause it takes back your power in recognizing I have a choice and I'm, I'm choosing to stay even if it's hard versus, or it's right. Be- because instead of feeling like, oh, I'm stuck here against my own will versus I have a choice and I'm choosing to, to stay here. <laughs> oh my God. Right? No, it's it, such it is a, a huge, it is a shift. huge, like your day can look exactly the same. And if you make that shift of like, I'm choosing to go to work, I hate my job, but I'm choosing to go to work. Yeah. This is a deliberate choice rather than like, I don't have yeah. a choice. I have to go to work. Yeah. It makes a yeah. huge, huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. Taking back your own agency responsibility for yourself and your life. It is very powerful. Okay, so how do you stay connected to your most authentic self? I guess as you go about life, do you have any tips on continuing to stay aligned? Yeah, checking in and observing. I think that those would be my biggest tips. So, And how do you check in? Good question. Um, I actually journal, although I was like, journaling won't save you. Um, I do journal. I love journaling too. (laughs) I love journaling. Yeah. So that's something that I will do is I will journal. And then I have a couple people that I'm very, very close with. I'm an introvert, so I'm not a big people person, but I have a couple of really close friends. And it's interesting because, you know, I, I travel a lot, so I'm not around them. So we'll do like a weekly phone call. And during that weekly phone call, I get to hear myself summarize my week, my actions. And there's something really interesting about that reflection. And so sometimes it's through relationships, sometimes it's through journaling. So it's a lot of checking in, a lot of observations. One journaling question I love is what did I learn about myself today? If you journal at nighttime, it's a really great one. And it forces you to pay attention. Otherwise, you're not going to know how to answer that question. And so it's just about a, a tuning. It's really not that hard. As in like, this is simple. It's just tedious and annoying. And we get bored and we don't want to do it. But there isn't like this really complex formula. It's like, pay attention to what you're doing. (laughs) If you don't like it, change it and make sure you're checking in. And that's, you know, for me, that's worked. Right. Right. Are there any other like habits and routines that you do in your lifestyle aside from journaling? I love to, this, (laughs) I love to go for walks, but listen to music. And there's something about that combination of like, it's almost like me- my meditation. It's like when I daydream, so almost so to speak, it's like I envision what I want to do. I have those conversations I didn't have, but want to have. And it's like my brain is clearly processing and it's my favorite way to do it because then my body's also involved and it's it's almost purging of this like 
energy and nervousness or, or fatigue or whatever it is. And so whatever I've been holding on to for the day. And so for me, it's like moving my body while consciously sort of like um, manifesting has been really and reflecting has been really great. So that's something I do almost every evening. I journal throughout the day. And besides that, not really because I, you know, I travel six to eight months a year. It's always a little different. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, it's good to hear. I'm always curious people's like habits and just things that they do to keep up their wellness. And since you're a psychotherapist, I'm like, well, what, what does, what do you focus on? (laughs) Are you disappointed? I'm like two most basic things. (laughs) No, no, but those are, it's good to hear that because it's like, oh, that's all you need. Just walk, music, journal, like Like some friends. Yeah, exactly. Weekly phone call weekly mm-hmm. phone call it it's is. a community i didn't realize i missed that's huge most people don't do phone calls anymore <laughs> i know yeah. my friends force me because they're all like really cool and do phone calls and i like i hate it and then when i start i'm like this is great that's nice is there something that you feel like you're learning or relearning in your life right now yeah um that i can't control <laughs> my life. I can't control everything. And that's a really obvious one. But I think especially if you're someone who's as, you know, focused on responsibility, you can sometimes confuse responsibility with control because you can be like, well, every day I'm being deliberate, I'm being intentional. And then that can become like, well, then I should be able to control outcomes and, and everything going perfectly right. And it's such an, it's a very thin line for perfectionists, I feel, depending on your personality. And so for me, it was kind of like, um, I'm going to be deliberate and I, you know, I'm going to be intentional and responsible and yet I cannot control things. And I'm going to be incredibly frustrated by that, but I need to let it go. And I just need to ask myself what now? Pivot, adjust and move on. And so that's something that, you know, I, I, especially in work context, I would like to think that like everything's always under control in terms of like all the posts are, I don't know, as silly as like, there's no typos and every post goes up at the same time. It's like, well, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes meta has a, has a moment and he glitches and he doesn't, you know, that's like a silly example, but I think it's like an interesting lesson of like, you can't control everything. Um, and so I've been kind of relearning and sitting with that. What a great reminder, because I think we all have to learn and, and grapple with that. And the, I guess the key thing is like knowing that you, you do have control over your own actions, but you don't have control over the outcomes and the results that Correct. of those actions. So it's always some, there's always some element of surprise. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> That's what I love. Yeah. Surprise. <laughs> no, it, it, yeah. It makes life interesting. Sure does. All right, Sarah, if you were to leave our audience with a final message today, what would that be? Your greatest success is not going to be what you achieve or accomplish. Your greatest success is going to be who you become. And I think that's like something I think about a lot. I think we get so bogged down with particular goals or things that we're doing And we attribute that success to our worth. But I I genuinely think the only thing that matters at the end of the day is the person that you become. Um, And I think that's something that we're going to feel the most fulfilled, excited, and proud of. Um, And so that's just something I think about all the time. And hopefully we'll get others to think about the way that they prioritize things and the way they go through their everyday life. That's beautiful. I totally resonate with that. And it it goes back to what you know, what we're saying just now about you can't control the outcome. So like, it's not about like your achievements. It's really about like your growth in this whole journey of life, right? Whether you succeed or fail, like you're going to grow. And it's like, that is the success. (laughs) It's who you become. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Well said. Absolutely. All right, Sarah, where can we find you online? Sure. So I'm most active on Instagram at millennial.therapist. You can check out my website, Sarah Kubrick. And I actually write uh, weekly newsletters. Um, One is psychology related. One is more philosophy related. So it's called Notes from My Phone. Those are psychology ones because I have my phone with me all the time. Anytime I have a thought, I write it down in my notes. 
And then I make an article out of it. And so it's kind of a joke because I did it so much. My friends were like, really? And then I have another one called the Phenomenological Society. And that's for people who are more interested in like exploring existentialism and all these kind of heavier topics. Oh, and also my book, which is sold everywhere books are sold. (laughs) So yay. Yay. Amazing. Thanks so much for being here today, Sarah. I resonated so much with your story and everything you share about. Um, Yeah. Thank you so much. I had such a great time. Thank you so much for having me.